Hey, hey, y'all. Back again. This time we're talking about Mark Fisher's capitalist realism. So a pretty important text with like contemporary Marxist thought. Uh, but before jumping into that, a few things to say. You can find this on Instagram or find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy. If you just want to see mostly pictures of my cats, uh, you can also find this in podcast form wherever you find your podcast if you prefer it that way. There are no ads, at least there shouldn't be on any of that. So that's a lot better. Um, also, if you, anyone wants to contribute, which would be great, you can find me on PayPal or Patreon, and there are links for that in the description. For now, I'd like to thank uh, Boz, Honrick, James, John, Juiced, or Used, Killswitch, Matt, Nicholas, and Sebastian, uh, as well as Ashley, who have all been extremely helpful in keeping this going. Uh, thank you very much for your support. Now, without further ado, time to jump in here to Mark Fisher's Capitalist Realism. So the first chapter is titled, It's Easier to Imagine the End of the World Than It Is to Imagine the End of Capitalism, which is an idea that he takes here from uh, Slavoj Zizek and Frederick Jameson. And it's a pretty grim statement, but one that if you reflect upon it, seems to be really true, especially when we think about, you know, the impending ecological crisis, or any of our other crises that, that we are in the, in the midst of, or in the throes of, that, you know, for many reasons, people feel the need to defend capitalism in the face of these things. So it seems as though our demise is more likely than the end of capitalism, which is obviously not good. So he starts with this chapter by meditating on the um, book and movie titled Children of Men. Now, for those that haven't seen it, this movie is kind of a dystopian uh, fiction in which people have a dystopian fiction, I would, I would hope it's fiction, uh, in which People have grown infertile, and they are unable to reproduce. And so there's a kind of lionization of the youngest people, for they are ostensibly going to be the ones that live longest. And there's a kind of like overarching sense of nihilism for the fact that there's nothing anyone can do about it. And people are just kind of holding hand in hand to the end of human humanity. Now, one of the perhaps unintended consequences of this you know, in t a terrible uh, event that is the the fact that people are, have grown infertile is that there's been a kind of dystopian military rule put in place. Now, it's unclear as to whether or not, you know, this rule was kind of taken over by the, you know, capitalist um, interests, you know, in order to kind of galvanize or, or hoard as much as the wealth and power as possible, or if it came about through a kind of democratic means because people thought like, well, you know, we need as much order as we can in these times. So it's fairly unclear, at least according to Fisher here. Now, it would seem incredibly uh, difficult to imagine in this movie any reversal of these measures uh, occurring, that is, of these kind of disciplinary measures, these kinds of orderly uh, moves for them to be undone. So the idea here is that once these things have happened, it's kind of like a slippery slope into more and more control. So he says that this is analogous to what we saw in the United States and much of the world, really, after 9-11, where 9-11 saw the implementation of various new measures of kind of surveillance and control, especially in certain areas like airports and, and other kind of borders and stuff like that. So it would seem uh, almost impossible for us to imagine these things going back, as though there could ever be a time when people say, you know what, our... Uh, anxiety, our paranoia has gone on long enough, we have to dial back, you know, the clock on this. So it's almost like, imagine uh, a, a kind of zip tie, okay, wrapped around your wrists. And this zip tie, every time you kind of click it a little bit tighter, you can't pull it back. Like it stays at that tight, tightness level. It can only go even more tighter from there. And every time you click it, it gets more and more tight, more and more tight, and you can't actually go back. You need to kind of cut the entire thing off, right? And this is my own analogy for the what is necessary, a kind of complete overhaul of these, of these binds in order to uh, overturn the system. Now, he, he uses this idea of this impossibility, the impossibility to kind of undo these measures, to think about the way that capitalism has become the only possibility in our minds. It is the only alternative, it is the only, you know, economic way to organize the world. And when this happens, when capitalism becomes its kind of own self, 
fulfilling uh, you know, prophecy, it becomes its own, its own destiny. He says that then we enter into capitalist realism where there's no alternative. And he provides the following definition where he says that it is the widespread sense that not only is capitalism the only viable political and economic system, but also that it is now impossible even to imagine a coherent alternative to it. So capitalism, though, is really effective, at least Mark Fisher says, because it is not what it claims to be. And what it claims to be is uh, the kind of arbiter for a free market, purely individualistic enterprise. And what he finds, and he uses children of men once more to think about this, is that capitalism relies pretty heavily on the state and a lot of what the state has to offer. Some things being like the police and the military and surveillance, things that capitalism uses very effectively towards its own ends, all the while um, demonizing, chastising everything to do with government. So it takes what it wants from government, but then leaves the rest, just like how uh, in you know George under George Bush Jr. Uh, George W. Bush, there was obviously a great move to try to uh, limit government power, while at the same time there was a move to increase government spending when it came to military uh, efforts and wars and stuff, as though these things aren't government actions. So it's you know we're dealing with a kind of paradox here the an antinomy uh where t you know two conflicting opinions are being held about something or a paralogism that you know strikes us here that that is right in our face when it comes to uh capitalism so like the film that is the film children of men there is no kind of clear outline as to how the situation came about and fisher then says because there is no clear uh kind of delineation of what occurred then it makes it that much more difficult to find out what we must do to mitigate its effects or to undo it, which he says is analogous, perhaps it's the correlative to what we see with at least uh, present day capitalism in that its foundations are, are not in incredibly uh, clear. It, it's quite opaque and it makes it that much more difficult then to find out a kind of process of possible reversal or at least one that can uh, kind of demolish those foundations because they're difficult to kind of pin down. So, you know, a good Marxist might respond and say, well, no, quite simply, it comes down to the, uh, the idea of base and superstructure. And the base, you know, the economic relations upon which the superstructure uh, is allowed to flourish or is allowed to kind of grow, it is that base that is the foundation. So it's very clear then to see where the problem lies. Fisher then is, is a little bit more careful in how he wants to imagine challenging capitalism because he doesn't want to risk just putting all the eggs in one basket and saying, like, if we just do this one thing, then, you know, all our problems will be solved. Now, I say that, and I want to add a little asterisk by saying, like, he does oscillate. He does, at times, you know, recognize the difficulty of, of positioning a single enemy uh, that is, you know, capital and saying, like, it is only capital and we must go right after capital in order to undo this and then on the other hand he's, he wants to recognize the complexities of that process so I think it's important to maintain this kind of tension and not to you know say at least in what I think we're reading here in Fisher is that it's one or the other so he draws another parallel from children of men and that is the idea that fertility or infertility uh, can be extended to our own situation under late capitalism and that is because a lack of fertility implies that there is um, the in incapability to produce newness, which he says is indicative of capitalism in that it only wants to reproduce what is you know, common, what is uh, standard, what uh, Theodore Adorno calls standardization. Once we have figured out what sells, then other producers, all they try to do is mimic that because they exist under the um, pretense of making more money. And if more money means producing the same song over and over again, then that is what they're going to do. So one of the other consequences of this is that we forget about things like history in order to always be, it's, we always consider the present without considering newness. So we always want to see a replication of what we have right now, which means both a forgetting of the future and a forgetting of the past. So we have a very myopic view of, of history in this way, focused specifically on the present. And he says this is adduced, at least evidence of this is provided by the fact that we have things like museums that kind of capture 
the past in a, in a kind of simulated form in order for us to con to feel as though we haven't lost touch of the past. So we crowd ourselves into museums as though we have, you know, a history to look back upon, and then we can leave the museum and forget all about it because history doesn't really affect us in in any kind of clear way. And this is this is a reductive way to look at it, obviously, to look at uh, present day, quote unquote, present day civilization, at least in the quote unquote West. Um, but there is a point to it in that the, the history of the West is very much a present history. It is concerned mostly with what it can do right now, not, you know, learning from its uh, mistakes of the past. So with this kind of destruction of history comes for Fisher, a destruction of anything that might be superstitious or, or mythical in favor of a kind of realism. And here's another, you know, capitalist realism plays into this because it is for him that the uh, enterprise of realism, pal excellence, it is the one that prides realism above all other things. And this is one of capitalism's most effective strategies. It convinces people that it is the only viable system. Therefore, it is able to say, look, we must then have some kind of affinity or connection with something that is natural or innate to humans. So people point to the past and say, look, competition has existed forever, and capitalism is the system that fosters competition. So therefore, it must be natural. It must be real. So capitalism then has a certain purchase or a kind of special purchase on this claim to naturality or to realism, which is just more emphasizing more of the same. So Fisher takes the time now to consider how he feels his project is different or his conception of capitalist realism, that is the situation we find ourselves in, is different from what Frederick Jameson describes as postmodernism. So for Frederick Jameson in the 80s, he was suggesting that postmodernism was the, you know, the cultural logic of late capitalism. That postmodernism emerges at, in response to and as a product of late capitalism. So Fisher says that capitalist realism is different from postmodernism in three ways. He, firstly, he says that when Jameson was describing postmodernism in the 80s, there were still alternatives to capitalism, at least ostensibly. So we should all know that the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, which marked, at least ostensibly, the end of the Soviet Union, the end of communism, at least ostensibly. Uh, so that would then signal that over the course of most of the 80s there was still that kind of antagonism present antagonism antagonism present in the form of communism to capitalism whereas now we don't have that there is there isn't that same kind of antagonism uh the second reason is that jameson believed postmodernism to exist in proximity to modernism and therefore it kind of appropriated it for example uh, this is the one he gives, surrealist techniques would appear in advertising. For Fisher, on the other hand, modernism has been completely eviscerated, uh, occasionally resurrected as what he calls a froze, frozen aesthetic style, never as an ideal for living. So whereas previously uh, the kind of tenets or some of the maybe aesthetic um, qualities of modernism could be revived as you know kind of relics of a past that can be aspired to in the future now they have been completely evacuated of any potential and they have been if they're used at all they're purely appropriated for the sake of their uh, being appropriated so one you know I, uh, the most perfect example of this is vaporwave if if you aren't familiar with this vaporwave is a kind of strange genre if you can call it a genre of music that kind of exists in between the 80s and and the 2020s while using elements of both and caught between kind of modernist or even earlier than that like renaissance art anyways it's a kind of hodgepodge of all of these kinds of aesthetic domains and these aesthetic qualities into a, a kind of a repackaging of what happened in the 80s it's very strange and if you aren't familiar with vaporwave it's worth looking into on on youtube or whatever uh, i should say i happen to listen to it a lot because i'm i'm just a postmodern uh <laughs> tool 
I guess. Anyways, I digress. The third reason here why Fisher sees capitalist realism as being different from postmodernism is that in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, capitalism attained its force by being the most appealing alternative to the other systems, that is, like communism. Now, because these systems have vanished, capitalism conjures up almost simulated, and this is these are his words here, alternative or independent cultural zones. So it doesn't actually have the antagonism, and this kind of mirrors the first point. It produces its own antagonisms, its own enemies within itself, which makes it all the more effective at continuing itself on its course. So one example of this he uses is uh, rock music or punk kind of grunge and uh, Kurt Cobain and Nirvana, for those that aren't familiar, and how uh, capitalism pre-corporates, in his, in his words, pre-corporates these antitheses. Like one example I like is like punk music that has been, you know, appropriated by capitalism because it's a pretty good way to make money if you can commodify even resistance. If you can commodify, you know, the counter-revolution, then not only do you find another way to make money, you find a way to keep your system going indefinitely. So that pushes us here into chapter two. What if you held a protest and everyone came? So he starts out this chapter by considering further the idea that capitalism contains within it the possibility for anti-capitalism in these kind of simulated forms. And he provides the example of the Disney Pixar movie WALL-E, in which there's the world has kind of succumbed to its, um, its extreme consumerist practices to the point that all the resources have been effectively depleted, and humans are sent off on this spaceship called the Axiom in space, in space, of course. Meanwhile, what was supposed to be happening was that there was supposed to be a mass cleanup operation occurring on Earth in order to kind of revitalize it, which, of course, doesn't happen. And there's one lone robot who, who remains who, who ends up saving humanity. Now, Wally, as far as the movie goes, is a pretty prescient uh, warning or kind of even critique of the effects of capitalism, at least on our world. And I would like to say, as an aside, like... The way that capitalism is affecting this world, we often paint it as though it's the world that's going to be the victim, and definitely the world will suffer, species will suffer, but humans will, the world will long outlive humans. Um, but this movie depicts it in such a way that the world actually kind of dies, and humans are then forced to leave it, which is an interesting perspective. But anyways, so... What Fisher says about this movie is that this movie kind of acts as our critique. Where the, we can watch this movie and then we can critique it, but then we turn off the television and watch something else. Or we, having seen it in the movie theater, we then leave and then we don't think about it. So we can breathe a sigh of relief knowing that, oh good, someone out there made this movie, therefore someone out there is thinking about this, great. Like we can absolve ourselves of any responsibility and just move on. So in his words, he says that so long as we believe that capitalism is bad, we are free to continue to participate in capitalist exchange. So according to Zizek, capitalism in general relies on this structure of disavowal. So we pretend as though it's enough to critique, right? As though we can, we can just sit, sit around, we can point to all the problems of it, and then therefore we have done our part, which is just, you know, a way by which the system can continue itself. So the capitalists are, you know, brushing their hands together with a big smirk on their face as everyone, you know, theorizes and thinks about what to do instead of doing anything. So one of the other examples he gives, or I guess it's two examples, are the Live Aid concerts. Or well, a Live Aid concert in 1985 that featured, you know, artists like Queen and David Bowie and uh, Ultravox. I don't know why that one came to my head. Uh, you know, a number of different bands that um, from 1985 that was meant as a huge fundraiser for uh, uh, starving people in, in some African countries. And then again, in 2005, another one occurred. Now, Fisher looks upon these efforts, that is, these fundraising efforts with a great deal of suspicion, because he says that it was, it was paraded that Western consumerism far from being in intrinsically implicated in systemic global inequality, could itself solve 
systemic global inequality. So in this whole process, they or in these big live shows, which attracted, you know, I think to date, it's still one of the most watched things in all of human history. Uh, that is Live Aid in 1985, I, I'm pretty sure. It was believed that by participating in this kind of mass consumerist enterprise that, you know, things like world hunger could could be eradicated. But of course, that doesn't get at the, the systemic problems that will just continue to reproduce world hunger. And it goes to that, you know, famous uh, saying by that, I believe it was by that monk, you know, who said that, like, when I feed the poor, I'm called a saint. But when I ask why there are poor uh, people, then, then I'm called a communist. And I think that really speaks to what Fisher is getting at here. And that pushes us here into chapter three, capitalism and the real. So he starts at this chapter by saying that capitalist realism is a pervasive atmosphere conditioning not only the production of culture, but also the regulation of work. It's ubiquity, and that's the, yeah, that's the quote, so pretty much it's it's ubiquity, that's, that is, it's all omnipresence, it's existing everywhere, makes any challenge to it difficult to imagine, which we've already kind of alluded to in the first chapter. The task then should be to reveal it for how it's in, uh, inconsistent, how it is inconsistent or untenable, which demands dissimulating the naturality or realism believed of it. So instead of it being regarded as kind of humanity's salvation, it should be revealed for its very inconsistencies. And this isn't new. In the history of, you know, Marxist thought, we go right back to Marx. That is exactly what he was describing, that uh, capitalism, like many of the systems that preceded it, is rife with inconsistencies. One of them being that the world is finite, yet capitalism seems to think that you can extract from the world indefinitely or that you can continually extract surplus value from, from labor, so you pay people less and less and take from them more and more, and that won't inevitably lead to a kind of, um, to a, a kind of evacuation of all potential from people, right? You kind of take from them all you can take. Or one of the other ones, and this is touted by, uh, you know, people in... Um, you know, Silicon Valley, when we think about automation, one of the problems with that is that if everything turns to automation, then suddenly the people producing things with automation are not going to have consumers to buy those things because they don't have people working in order to make wages that they can then use that money to come, go back and buy the stuff with. So he then positions the realism of capital, capitalism with the real of capitalism. Now, this demands a little bit of an exposition into Lacan's thought, which I'm by no means an expert on, but I can I think I can kind of give a fair um, idea about what Fisher is using it for, where he says that in Lacan, the real is kind of like what subtends or, or exists underneath and allows for the possibility of social relations to emerge in a social field. And of course, within that, you know, even our idea about uh, ourselves, our identities, anything like that exists upon the real. Now, the real is kind of like the unseen highway that connects all of these things. So we, we don't see it, we can't recognize it. But there are brief moments where we can kind of glimpse into it, and these happen at various ruptures. So in the case of capitalism, when one of these contradictions is revealed, then suddenly we see the kind of puppet uh, master behind behind the curtains like in the Wizard of Oz and we see it for what it really is that is its problems the kind of illusions upon which uh, it 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 has its uh, lays its claim to truth so another such real is the environmental catastrophe that you know if we stare at it in the face we have to come to terms with the fact that our system is unsustainable and its claim to superiority or its claim to uh, being you know regulating itself or sustaining itself through the market is completely uh, is completely incorrect. Another real is the kind of mental illnesses that emerge in response to late capitalism, like stress and depression, which he talks about in, in the next chapter, chap chapters four and five. And then he says another real 
is the bureaucracy that capitalism uh, relies upon. Now, you might ask, well, why is that a real? Why is that a thing that capitalism tries to veil? It tries to veil that because capitalism was supposed to be the response to bureaucracy. That is the kind of Stalinist bureaucracy that emerged in the Soviet, Soviet Russia. But, you know, look around. There's no way anyone of us can really do anything in this, in this world without going through some kind of bureaucratic enterprise. So he wants to think about these two things specifically, that is mental health and bureaucracy. And he thinks about them in relation to his experience in the uh, further education college in Britain, where students from working class backgrounds were drawn to if they wanted, to, wanted an alternative to more formal state educational institutions. So because of their location, these schools were often a testing ground for neoliberal reforms of education. So the, what I mean by their location was that they drew in students that would otherwise not fit in with the regular, quote unquote, regular kind of public school institutions. So in many cases, there's a kind of classist implication here where students who are obviously going to be um, less affluent would be attracted here to, and the state saw them then as more like guinea pigs than anything else. So he's going to now think about that in the next chapter, chapter four, titled Reflexive Impotence, Immobilization, and Liberal Communism. So he starts out by saying that British students, you know, the ones that he was seeing and that this further education college, uh, were less radical than their French counterparts uh, because of their, what he calls their reflexive impotence, which is the knowledge that there is nothing they can do. That is about their position or about their, their economic conditions or anything like that. But of course, this isn't their fault. Like, no one wants this. This is instead, for Fisher, uh, a consequence of the effects of late capitalism on these young minds. Now, this is where I must criticize Fisher for what he's about to say. Where he says that these kinds of people that he recognizes as being uh, kind of em embracing a kind of impotence that is in their... Uh, believing that there's nothing that can happen. He says that they enter a kind of depression, which is fair. That, that seems like it could be the case. So we saw in the school that these students were not so much depressed because of the, a lack of pleasure, but instead because they were depressed because of their inability to do anything else except pursue pleasure. So this is essentially difficult for people to navigate because they are both placed under intense surveillance and control, while also encouraged to shop and consume and to be pleasured or to, to strive for pleasure. Now, in the problem with this or something that we should really, you know, be careful about when he, when he says something like this is that for many people that, you know, exist uh, in, in a certain class dynamic where they are marginalized, where they are oppressed, their concern is not so much the pursuit of pleasure than it is the pursuit of survival. So it seems like a strange kind of disavowal of that fact. And it, it really seems to regress, at least in my reading of it, where Mark where Fisher's just being like this kind of like old, like, oh, the youth today are, you know, they're too concerned with their, what he, what he says, their PlayStation, or he says um, PlayStation all night TV and, and marijuana. Like, okay, Mark Fisher, like, okay, put that judgmental tone away. And is this really the case for rich people? Like, why is it that we only condemn poor people that try to strive for pleasure as being part of the problem, but we don't think about that in terms of rich people who are, by and large, the hedonistic ones of our kind of time, of our, of our age? So it seems kind of condemnatory, and, it, and it's like blaming people for wanting to, you know, pursue what little happiness they can in this very alienating world. Um, and it seems kind of focusedly individualistic but you know i'd like to hear your rebuttals if anyone wants to defend fisher here um so he says that the search for pleasure has marked a new system of control so we we can accept that which is a kind of a post-disciplinary form of control now what does that mean post-disciplinary well there's no one with like a gun or sitting in a watchtower telling us what we can and cannot buy or what we should and shouldn't buy. So when students are online, they might know they're being surveyed. Chances are they don't, they just don't care because what the internet affords them far outweighs 
any potential harm that can be caused by their uh, information being taken from them or their conversations being spied on or anything like that because there's no immediate consequence. So this is kind of post-disciplinary in that it's disciplinary. It, it's the disciplining system that we are so accustomed to, like with guns and military and police, has been so effective that we've come to discipline ourselves. And we discipline ourselves by submitting so easily to these kinds of hidden forms of control, these hidden forms of um, surveillance. So he says then it's no wonder really that people don't read anymore uh, because, you know, we don't, with the ADD is running rampant and whatever, and it's really difficult for people to focus. And yeah, yeah sure, he, he might have a point, but we can't forget the fact that his generation is the one that started, you know, wars like in Vietnam and, and, and everything else before then. So it seems as though setting um, a benchmark of people being able to read as being like a step toward something uh, a better system forgets that some of the most brutal people in history were incredibly intelligent in terms of these capacities or as in terms of these benchmarks now i say all this and i'm critical of fisher but i also recognize that what he's doing is extremely powerful and helpful here but it's important to take it with it with a grain of salt so in the face of all this schooling kind of loses its meaning because school is just kind of uh, push people out, right? You know, and this is something that I think we've all recognized is that it, kids don't really fail these days. It's really about just kind of pushing them through onto the next teacher who will have to deal with it. And then they just push them through until they finally make it to the end. And then that's, that's really the case. And then it makes it impossible to really teach. So school is not then really like the ivory tower that it's made out to seem. It is instead what he calls the engine room of the reproduction of social reality. You know, this kind of like um, uh, production line idea of just kind of uh, getting kids through as fast as possible so that a new crop can come in. So overall, he wants to characterize the society not so much as a Foucauldian one with like surveillance and the, the idea of the panopticon and someone sitting in a tower watching. He instead locates this more along the lines of what Deleuze calls a control society, which is like the pure internalization of all forms of control that, you know, we don't need any kind of, um, you know, guard tower person watching us to kind of maintain which is, I'm not totally clear on that distinction because Foucault doesn't think that either. Foucault says that he just uses that as an analogy and then says we're, we are beyond that. Like that, that is something of, I guess even that's a relic of the past when he moves into the, what he calls the carceral state. So in the face of this kind of control society, it would be wrong for us to try to implement the old forms of control. So like implementing discipline. And this is one of the images that comes out of, you know, kind of Soviet propaganda was that, you know, it's about work and it's about order and structure, which is um, obviously problematic and more of a reactionary response to capitalism rather than a, a, a meaningful alternative to it. Now, he says kind of tangentially that a meaningful uh, undoing of capitalism demands a consideration of newness without it being for the sake of newness, right? As we saw earlier with like capitalism just appropriating the new for its own benefit in order to reproduce the same over and over again. So now he's going to consider more closely, that is in the next chapter, uh, post-Fordism and the distinction between Fordism and post-Fordism. So that brings us to chapter five, October 6, 1979. Don't let yourself get attached to anything. Now, he starts this chapter by considering the, the film Heat, which I haven't seen, but I'm familiar with. It's like a gangster movie from the 90s, I guess, the late 90s, maybe, mid to late 90s, uh, to older gangster films like The Godfather and Goodfellas, where he says that Heat's Los Angeles is a world without landmarks, a branded sprawl where markable territory has been replaced by endlessly repeating vistas of replicating franchises. So he says that the ghosts of old Europe that stalked Scorsese, like with uh, Goodfellas, and, and Coppola with uh, The Godfather, the, those streets have been exercised, or those ghosts have been exercised. So in, you know, The Godfather, there is the kind of commitment to uh, a, a, a so-called history, 
that is a history that goes back to Italy in, the, in these cases. But um, what we see in heat, at least according to Fisher, is a detachment from that where people, that is the other gangsters, are only going after the pursuit of money. There's no attachment to history or identity or anything like that. So instead of them having a kind of national identity, Fisher just says they're just like entrepreneurs that just go where the money is and that's it. They have no commitment to anything else. Now he uses this to demonstrate the distinction between Fordism and post-Fordism. Where Fordism is kind of uh, corresponds to like Goodfellas and the Godfather in that there was maybe some kind of connection to tradition. I, w I wouldn't go so far there. Uh, where formally, I guess, workers would have some connection to a single set of, would have a single set of skills that they would apply then for a, a chunk of their lives by working in like one factory, right? And this is, I don't know why he lionizes this, because like this was still bad that people were, you know, being exploited on a mass scale. And it seems like he's, he's romanticizing this point in capitalism's history. But even if he isn't, and I'm just reading him wrong, what he's saying is that um, under Fordism, you know, you had some skill. You're always a white dude, but in going to this job where you'd get paid well, uh, and you'd go back to your nuclear family with your 2.3 kids and white picket fence and dog. This is, you know, the vision of America as it as it was that we, you know, Trump promised to bring people back to, if it even existed. So I I don't know. I have tr trouble with this, but this is the idea. And th that was kind of nice because it gave people a kind of structure. Whereas under post-Fordism, that he puts uh, as a correlative to the movie Heat, there's no structure. It's, you know, people take jobs wherever they can. So what we see here is the emergence of a kind of gig economy and what is called a just-in-time economy. So people just work to make enough through like contracts and stuff instead of any having any stability. So this takes the pressure off of employers because they don't need to pay out things like health care or, or retirement plans or anything like that because they can just wherever there's um, there's a lot of turnover all employee employees uh, come and go quite quickly so there's no need to maintain any of these other things so it's a kind of like pure wage labor where that is all you're making so this is how um, Fisher characterizes this difference and this quote will, I think, I don't know, reveal to you my wariness or why I'm wary about the way that he romanticizes this Fordist past. He says, where formerly workers could acquire a single set of skills and expect to pro progress upwards through a rigid organizational hierarchy, now they, they are required to periodically reskill as they move from institution to institution, from role to role which is obviously bad. Like this is something that we shouldn't we shouldn't celebrate this transition into post-Fordism. Absolutely not. It is a worse situation. But we can also just say that these were both terrible situations, which he might be doing. I don't know. I might be being unfair. So what we see here is then this transition into a gig or just-in-time economy or, or in labor. And of course, this portends a transformation in the laborers' nervous systems to make them capable of living through such unpredictability and precarity, which of course is for uh, Fisher is the, is the reason why there's so much depression, anxiety, stress, because there isn't that sense of stability. And he says, and I don't know why he says this, but he's like, this is in part the, the fault of the workers who many of them didn't want to work in a single factory for 40 years and then earn enough for retirement and then leave. People wanted opportunities. People wanted to be their own individual selves because they wanted, you know, what they did to reflect who they were. And because who they were was always changing and developing, then what they wanted to do would change and develop. And so we almost yearn to go back to this kind of Fordist instance where there was a much more clear line of demarcation between the worker and, and you know, the, the landowner, the capitalist. Whereas now we just, you know, we just hate ourselves. We just turn that kind of judgmental pendulum or, or it swings back from the capitalist to ourselves where we are constantly uh, surveying ourselves. We are constantly putting ourselves under self-surveillance, saying the same thing twice, so that we can be effective um, laborers in this very precarious system. And then he presents all these studies about why then there's no surprise that we've seen 
an upshot in the in the um, cases of uh, depression or stress in the past 30 or 40 years. Now, one of the additional strategies that capitalist realism mobilizes is that it makes mental illness an individual problem that is reducible to biology. So we can say, there's just something wrong with your biology. There's something wrong with you. It's not the system. It's not the structure. It's just you. So take these drugs because we know it's a natural thing. And these drugs that are going to affect your natural physiological body are going to cure you. So then what is what is happening or two things are happening here. They are enforcing the strength of pharmaceutical companies, but they are also integrating the idea that there is uh, only individual solutions to large systemic problems, which of course doesn't get at the entire picture. And that pushes us here into chapter six. All that is solid melts into PR, which is public relations, market Stalinism, bureaucratic anti-production. So he starts out this chapter by thinking about the movie Office Space. And for those that haven't seen it, it's a kind of funny take on the just how mundane life is for, you know, uh, office workers, where pretty much the most excitement in anyone's day is uh, what message the printer is going to read out to them that day in its uh, ineptitude, in its failure to actually produce the proper print. And that's just one of the moments. But what this movie shows or, or illustrates is the, the kind of um, the the ineptitude of bureaucracy as well, where there are all these kind of bureaucratic figures throughout the movie. Uh, one of the big components of the film is that an, uh, a kind of exterior surveyor or an exterior uh, couple of analysts or um, that are going to gauge the uh, kind of efficacious how, how efficacious the workers are are two kind of bumbling uh, totally incompetent people that are not actually effective at determining whether or not workers are being good workers so we have here a kind of reversal of of, of the the process they were supposed to be you know the assessors of what is good work but then it's revealed that they themselves are incapable of good work and one of the examples is that one of the main characters is named uh, Michael Bolton and these two these two these two characters get so caught up in the fact that he has the same name as the the pop star Michael Bolton that they completely forget about their job and they pretty much like you know give another guy who who shows to be completely inept and doesn't care about his job give him like promotions and it's really quite funny to see that that occur but anyway so this is one of those other things from earlier from his discussion of the real of capitalism that is in this case bureaucracy that you know claims to do away or, or to be done away with but that actually thrives under capitalism so bureaucracy for him is characterized as um, an emphasis more on the image of doing work than actually doing work or than actually doing meaningful things so some of the things that are most important are like keeping a paper trail uh, you know, going through series of phases that can, you know, always be uh, checked up upon by other by people in uh, authoritative positions or of higher positions in order to assess how well the bureaucracy worked. And it seems as though bureaucracy only exists for more bureaucracy. It only exists for to keep itself alive rather than to actually make the thing that it claims to uh, be monitoring to be working for to make that thing better. So this bureaucracy obviously participates in this kind of control society because it keeps people in line. You know, people within the bureaucracy and the people that the bureaucracy kind of watches, keeps keeps gauge of. Now, he he takes goes into a little tangent here with Lacan once more to think about the idea and and Zizek to think about the idea of the big other, which is something I'm not totally familiar with, but we can think of the big other in this sense if I'm understanding it right. For for Fisher is kind of being the force that exists on the part of the masses that they have no knowledge of. So this is a force that is necessary to kind of subtends the social field, but it is, like I said, something that people aren't aware of, a kind of potential that they are not aware of. So he gives the example of a jewelry company executive who admitted to selling poor quality jewels and whose company uh, then subsequently collapsed as a result. So he says that kind of the big other has power but the people don't know this because once people found out about the um, this jewelry company, 
then they were didn't go there and then the company died at the whims of this big other that the people didn't organize around but it was a kind of group effort that we didn't even know we had so fisher is kind of suggesting that maybe there's a way to tap into that potential in order to challenge the entirety of capitalism but of course self-discipline keeps that at bay and here we move into chapter seven uh if you can watch the overlap of one reality with another capitalist realism as dream work and memory disorder so one of the really important things to do when coming to terms with the state of capitalism capitalist realism is that we're not coming to terms with a reality that is grounded and fixed which would be kind of the basis of any reality and that's what he's trying to show is that it's not real like in the way that we would associate anything with reality that is uh, permanence or immutability but instead we are concerned here primarily with a system that is constantly evolving and changing so the conditions of its so-called reality are not by by any means consistent so i should add in brackets of course like there are a few principles that remain uh like some of the guiding principles to know that we are still within even a capitalist system you know that the system is predicated upon wage labor or something like that that is predicated on the uh drive for profits that you know it it it, it puts the you know profit motive above so and so thing as long as these things are still intact then we know that we are still existing within capitalism um but with everything else it is constantly evolving and shifting like how those relations are conducted where they are being conducted against whom uh you know who becomes the oppressed who becomes the proletarian how is work done and so on and so forth so the kind of person that stands in for this system for um for fisher is kind of like the person that exists in middle management you know the people that were kind of depicted in office space so this is the person that you know probably earns just enough money to sleep at night with the kind of mild assurance that they will have a retirement at one point in their life like they stand in for this but they are also the person that is kind of the most controlled they are expected to be controlled in their being productive for this system so their being controlled is not so that they just act in one way their being controlled is that is so that they'll be as flexible as they can possibly be to accommodate this system and in effect we lose sense of our even ourselves of our identities and he uses examples here of like the born films the born like born ultimatum and born identity and all those movies memento and eternal sunshine of the spotless mind these are all movies in which characters have lost their history they've they've lost their memories and that is for him um a good example of the kind of or a good way to illustrate this phenomenon that people undergo under capitalism but he specifically focuses on the born movies now if you aren't familiar with that uh the first one i think is the born identity uh jason born played by matt damon wakes up i think he's on like a boat or something and he has no memory of who he is but he has like unparalleled fighting skills and other knowledge about the world and how to be like a secret agent and stuff and fisher says that isn't that interesting he loses his identity he doesn't know who he is yet he he works extremely effectively in this system as though he was on autopilot what better way to kind of characterize this worker today this worker that is forced to adapt in this kind of autopilot mode while losing all sense of self and to kind of gloss over these things we regress into hence the title a kind of dream work a kind of dream scenario where the contradictions of the system are glossed over are are sanitized so that we can keep going through this world and that puts us here into chapter eight there's no central exchange so if we think of 2008 that is the financial crisis of 2008 what we saw was not so much uh, uh, an antagonism between the state and capitalism we saw these two things going hand in hand where the state you know bailed out the big banks uh, for having screwed over the world pretty much because these people got greedy they fell asleep at the wheel they were not um nearly as responsible as they should have been with everyone's money or with handing out loans and it was a complete uh mess and of course no one really was punished for that even though they were their greed overtook everything but what we saw in this moment was that the state and capitalism are not nearly as separate as perhaps we sometimes believe them to be so we often then blame the state for problems that come about through capitalism and that you know the state just kind of 
exists as a scapegoat for the problems of capitalism. Now, this happens for one kind of big reason for, for Fisher. You know, it serves as a scapegoat for one kind of big reason in that it convinces us that there is still some possible control over the market. As though the market isn't just a completely, you know, rhizomatic thing without anybody at the helm. Where, you know, everything is just, it goes wherever it wants to and there's no, like, real control. There's no single person to, to, to point the finger at. Because it's a lot easier to blame the government, which has a face. Like, we know who belongs to the government. We know uh, where the government is. We don't know where capitalism is. There's no capitalism headquarters anywhere for people to kind of point the finger to. So there is then no responsibility. And he gives the example of a call center where he says that this, the call center is kind of indicative of this uh, lack of responsibility because in a, when you call a call center, and I'm sure we can all relate to this experience, you know, you talk to someone and they say, I can't help you. Let me connect you to someone else. And then they you talk to them and they're like, oh, uh, I'll send you to, to, to another person. And you find out you've actually been sent to the first person. And you're like, well, who can help me here? Like, it just seems like an endless deferral, an endless process of de uh, deferring responsibility. So all of this contributes to a kind of, um, because there's no system really to point the finger at. There is, but it's very difficult to see. And there's no single like headquarters of capitalism. People then often turn uh, the judgmental pendulum back upon themselves. They see themselves as being the problem. So people uh, th think that combating uh, climate change is an individual problem as though it can only happen by like people recycling at home. Forget, of course, the fact that most carbon emissions emerge from these huge companies that, that you know, just produce en masse or, or like fracking or anything like that. So that here then moves us into the final chapter where Fisher gives us kind of a look about as to what we can do or what can be done. And that's chapter nine titled Marxist Super Nanny. So he meditates here on the show called Super Nanny, which aired in like the early 2000s, uh, where a nanny kind of goes into rich families' houses and corrects, corrects or kind of fixes the house or fixes the household that he thinks is kind of overrun by um, hedonistic children where parents are only interested in making their kids happy and he attributes this to capitalism where capitalism forces both parents to work so he says that like when parents actually do get to spend time with their kids they don't want to be you know disciplinarians they want to have fun with their kids and that for for fisher produces a situation in which kids feel like they're super entitled to things which of course we can problematize and we should especially when we consider the fact that like why are we reacting like why why are we being reactionary to both parents working when for the longest time we seem to have no problem with the fact that women just exclusively were forced to stay at home but of course we, important to consider that so he says that the world almost needs a kind of marxist super nanny to come in and, and fix things to reveal the kind of systemic undertones of this world so that we can be better attuned to it in order to kind of elevate ourselves out away from it and this is different from kind of um adding in a an orderly almost fascistic uh paternalistic response like in the form like what happened uh, w with all these kind of reactionary movements in the 20th century up till today of course um, and instead he wants to think about the other possibilities or like the other kind of culprits that are important to recognize before we mount an effective strategy. One such kind of culprit being the internet that for him just affirms our kind of hedonistic desires, you know, the wanting more pleasure than, you know, than we can really handle, which is causing discord in our minds. You know, what it, yeah. And the internet is kind of like an echo chamber in that it just participates in that process of reproducing the same. That is, the internet, like everything else, wants us to see things be done uh, the same way they've been done, you know, the year before and the year before that and the year before that, because that's really the effective way that, um, you know, data can be extracted, right? Because if people are suddenly changing, it's difficult or it becomes more difficult then to anticipate trends, to anticipate uh, future desires and, and, and so on. So he says that the, 
Marxist super nanny would not only be the one who laid down limitations, who acted in our own interests when we are incapable of recognizing them ourselves, but also the one prepared to take this kind of risk, to wager on the strange and our appetite for it. And what he means by that is kind of our appetite for the new. And, and that is to push us into something new, to, to open the door for something new. So a, a kind of proper leftist strategy, and this is him writing against like the kind of Stalinist tradition, tradition, that Stalinist response to capitalism in the you know 20th century, um, he's saying that we don't necessarily want more state. We don't want more bureaucracy because that's part of the problem. He, he, he wants like more of a kind of individualistic response where people are free to embrace who they want to be, which to the cautious listener might say, well, that seems like an extension of the logic of capitalism, you know, this hyper individualistic logic. But of course, he wants a balance. He wants to find a balance between mobilizing group solidarity and within those groups, you know, uh, fostering a sense of kind of self identity. And he says all problems then, like, and these are the examples he gives, teenagers shooting each other and hospitals incubating aggressive superbugs are the effects of a single systemic cause, capital. Where he, and he believed that 2008 was a, was a hit against capital. And he interestingly prescribes a kind of austerity on the part of individuals, you know, to kind of self-regulate, a kind of asceticism, not aestheticism, asceticism, which is uh, kind of disciplining oneself, you know, not to enjoy the pleasures of the body or, or anything else, because that is what, you know, will move us into something better if we aren't focused on what capitalism offers, which is obviously problematic. Um, but anyways, it, it seems strange to me that he was celebrating um 2008 as a hit against capitalism because what followed that was you know not cuts to you know banking power it was cuts to you know health care cuts to education cuts to other social services through austerity through kind of uh, large-scale efforts to cut funding to things that people needed of course not the military or at least well i can't say that i don't know in the united states context if that's what happened but there were still many other cuts that happened to social services, to public goods. So the left should promise what capitalism promised, but actually deliver on it. And that is uh, an end, or what he calls a massive reduction of bureaucracy, which would ne necessitate a kind of focus on individuality, as we kind of said, and the realization of these individuals rather than on their work or them attaining their identity through their work in favor or at the behest of a kind of bureaucratic uh, overlord or bureaucratic overlords. And yeah, that's pretty much how he ends this off here. It's, you know, this is a really good contribution, obviously, uh, to contemporary Marxist thought. It would also be good, though, to consider some things like race or gender or, you know, sex or anything like that, because these things are affected differently under capitalism. And, and I think that by considering these things, if we are going to maintain a kind of Marxist framework, that is, if we are going to consider the ways in which capital lies at the root of some of these large problems, I think we can develop a better picture about what to do if we develop a more broad picture or more kind of holistic picture about how it affects people differently, because then we're going to have a kind of broader uh, kind of camp of knowledge or kind of broader base of knowledge from which to pull to understand our target that is in this case capitalism but yeah so that's about it if anyone has you know concerns i was pretty hard on fisher here um you know i i did sanitize my criticisms a little bit because it's not you know you're not here for that um but yeah if you know if i mischaracterized him in any way i'd love to hear about it if if he says things in other books that might clarify some points or, or you know would make it so that I would necess necessarily extend an olive branch to him, then absolutely I'd love to hear about it. Uh, and until then, catch you next time.